happy day, digital world. It's Data Viz Bob here. And today we're going to talk about how to stay motivated during your PhD studies. This video is dedicated to Saya Jamil, who is a PhD candidate in big data and machine learning at the University of Technology Patronas in Malaysia. So thank you, Syed. I hope I pronounced everything correctly. Thank you for sending this question. I did have to think about it because this is, uh, you know, this is an interesting question. And I also Googled, or not just Googled, but also YouTubed the answer to this question about how to stay motivated during your PhD studies. And I didn't see any videos already that were particularly, let's say, actionable, that didn't provide you with sort of actions that you could take in order to address this kind of topic or this theme. And ironically, I wouldn't call this a motivational video. There are lots of motivational videos out there already, general ones, which I will actually mention. But what this is, is an actionable kind of video where specific actions can be taken to try to address lack of motivation or to keep up your motivation during your PhD studies. So I had to use my imagination a little bit and think of why somebody or generally PhD candidates or students in general might not be motivated. And I thought of kind of five different common scenarios or common reasons or things that happen a lot that I hear about. And they're, they're broken down into these five categories. One is feeling lost. One is feeling stuck. Three is rejected papers. Four is a loss of interest in your topic. And then five is general negative thought patterns. So those are interesting topics. They're all very interesting, actually. So let's talk about them. So maybe you don't feel motivated during your PhD at some points because you're feeling lost, right? You, you don't know what to do. You just feel like, oh, wow, I don't know what to do. I feel lost, yeah? So my, my advice for this situation is basically hinges around, I hope you can read this, an effective plan and pattern of communication between you and your supervisor, right? Normally what happens between in, in meetings in general is there's no real plan, right? You just show up, maybe people say things, and then you leave after a while. But there's generally no structure or plan. There's not a special pattern that, that is, is followed. Right, so when you meet with your supervisor, actually you want to have a plan about what's going to happen during the meeting. And you want to have a special pattern of communication that consistently happens every time you meet your supervisor. Right? For example, when you leave a meeting with your supervisor, you want to know what to do. So in your pattern of communication, you want a to-do list, right? You want that, that information. You want to extract that to-do list of items from your supervisor before you leave that meeting. Another example, well, if another example is, well, what does your supervisor want to hear, right? Your supervisor, when you step in the room, your supervisor wants to hear some things. What do they want to hear? They want to hear about your progress, right? The supervisor is wondering, Oh, tell me about your progress. So before the meeting, you prepare a list of progress, right? And that's exactly what your supervisor wants to hear. And then that things will get started really nice, nicely. 
And then the other important element is a list of topics that you discussed with your supervisor during the meeting. So your supervisor is going to give you some advice. You're going to talk about different important topics and different subjects. And you just want to have a little list of the topics discussed during the meeting. Now that effective pattern of communication is described in something called Bob's Minutes of Meeting Protocol. Right? Bob's Minutes of Meeting Protocol is a structured pattern of communication that can take place every time you meet your supervisor. It tells you what information you want to extract from the meeting and what information you want to bring to the meeting. And it's a plan. It's a structured plan. It, it, it removes the random chaos from meetings. And it, it, it gets you on track. So you won't feel lost anymore, right? And I have a special YouTube video dedicated entirely just to this topic. And I will put a link to that in the description of, of this one. And please look at it if you want to not feel lost anymore. This minutes of meeting protocol is the answer. And I don't, it's not, it's called Boss Minutes of Meeting Protocol, but I cannot really take credit for it. I inherited this protocol from Vienna University of Technology from my supervisor. The only thing I did was I documented it and I wrote it down and, and explained it. So a second common reason you might not feel motivated during your PhD studies is that you are feeling stuck, right? So again, I'm going to refer back to the minutes of meeting protocol that I, because these two are closely related, feeling lost and feeling stuck. Stuck is, in my mind, like when you kind of know what to do, but you don't know how to do it so you feel stuck right <laughs> and that now this refers to the content of the meetings with your supervisor but this refers to the frequency how often you meet with your supervisor so that to me could be an indication that you're not meeting often enough with your supervisor right so like, in the ideal world, you would meet with your supervisor, in my opinion, once a week. But that is the ideal world. It gets complicated when people are traveling or with busy schedules and all those things. But twice a month is quite should be quite reasonable on average. It also depends a little bit about where you are during your PhD. In the beginning, you want higher frequency. And in the end, you want maybe lower frequency when you don't feel lost or stuck. And the other key thing here is to focus on short-term manageable tasks. That might sound like a paradox because your, your PhD is a long-term, big, blue skies project perhaps. But that's exactly a problem. If you focus on something that's too big and too complicated and too long-term, you can easily feel stuck or get stuck. The key to solving any large problem, like a thesis or a big complicated project, is to break it down into small manageable chunks, small chunks. And what I think is very helpful is in your in your meetings to think of on your to-do list tasks that can be accomplished in approximately one week. So if you have a list of tasks that can be accomplished in one week, that's perfect. It might not always be possible to, to do all the things on your to-do list in a week, but that, that's fine. But that's sort of the, the target to, to aim for. What is possible to finish in a week? or what is possible to finish between now and the next meeting with my supervisor. And that is, so that's really focusing on the short term goals. It sounds like a paradox and in some ways it is, but actually you only can focus on short term tasks. You know, you, you, you work 
every day for eight hours maybe. So what can you do in the next hour? What can you do in one day? And that, that's all you can really concretely and constructively work on. So another common reason I think that students don't feel or maybe lose their motivation during their PhD. One of the world's famous favorite topics is rejected papers. Right? You submit a research paper to a conference or a journal and it gets rejected. So a couple of things to think, this is a big topic in, in some ways, this is a big discussion by the way, but here's just a constructive, short, abbreviated, actionable kind of you know, thought pattern that you can, you can consider when you get a paper rejected. Keep in mind that you, you've done something quite good actually. So you've submitted a research paper to be reviewed. That is already a great step. A lot of people haven't got there yet or don't get there, right? That is good news. Just the fact that you submitted a research paper at all is great news. It means you're making progress, right? So that's something to definitely think about. Another thing to remember is most papers do get rejected. Most papers that get submitted get rejected, right? In, in computer science, it can be very brutal, right? Many, some conferences have things like 10% acceptance rate or 20% acceptance rate. And that is really, really competitive and really, really tough. So that means that 90 to 80 percent of papers get rejected and for competitive journals it's not very much different it's most papers actually get rejected but you never really hear about those you never see those and you, you, like you don't really experience those so you, you feel kind of alone when when your paper gets rejected you feel not so motivated but actually you're in a very large group of people that, that are the majority, actually. You're in the majority of people that submit papers. So don't forget that. Use the reviews, right? Because your paper can be resubmitted. It'll be reworked, resubmitted, right? You use those reviews constructively. Now, the, the other thing is, I'm not saying, I'm not saying like, don't be sad, right? I don't like it when my papers get rejected. <laughs> Not that they ever do, but yes, I, I don't like it. When I was a PhD student, I didn't like it. I still don't like it. It's fine to like cry for a little while, like cry for a few, a few hours or a few days. It's fine. You know, be sad for a week or whatever. But at some point you have to get over it, right? You know, after maybe a week of sadness at the, you know, the older you get, the, the quicker you bounce back, so to speak. And that, that ability, the ability to sort of get back up on your feet and continue forth when, when something has gone wrong, that actually has a name. And the name of that, the word for that is called grit. This, this word is not used very often in, in daily language. I don't hear it used very often. But I encourage you to Google the word grit. You'll find some great stories that have been written around this term. And I've read some great stories that have been written around the term. And it, it's exactly that. It's the ability to, to bounce back in the, in the face of adversity or after being knocked down, so to speak. And this, this, this sort of pattern is universal. It's, it's everywhere. It's, so adversity is interesting. <laughs> what do I mean by that? So that pattern of adversity, like trying to do something or trying to reach a goal and then having barriers in the way and things that knock you down, that is actually very interesting. And what I mean is 
that is the basis of every movie, every story, right? And everything that's interesting. Like every story and every movie is based on how a person reacts to adversity. What does a person do when there, something is in the way of, of getting to the, them to reach their goals, right? That, that's what makes a story interesting, right? If, if there was no adversity, no conflict or anything, then you wouldn't have an interesting story. And that's also what makes people interesting. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, imagine, imagine Rocky, like the film, the, the amazing film Rocky, if, you know, he got hit once, he got knocked down and just stayed down, right? That would be the end of the movie. But he, what makes the movie interesting is his ability to get back up again and then continue on fighting. Right. Otherwise, it would not be the movie would be very short. It wouldn't be very interesting. And if you haven't seen Rocky, like definitely go see it. It's it's a great movie. <clears throat> so adversity is interesting. Just a side comment. What makes people interesting is adversity too. The most interesting people in the world are the ones that overcome the most adversity. The more adversity somebody has overcome, the more interesting that person is. That is how you define an interesting person, right? You, you can think, like, who comes to mind? You think of people like Gandhi. You think of people like Martin Luther King and, and Rosa Parks, people that overcome tremendous adversity those are the interesting people right people that do things that say they could never be done or that's impossible right those are the interest neil armstrong you know just those are when you think about it that's what makes a person interesting so that's a fun topic and there, there could you know more can be said about this. This is a big topic and it comes up at the conferences I go to all the time, right? Every year that's a big topic. So a special video could be, you can Google like how, how to deal with a rejected paper and you'll get web pages about that topic. It's a great topic. Another common reason is losing interest in your PhD topic perhaps or maybe you just thought you lost interest and <clears throat> that could happen like you could lose interest in your topic and it, it, it can happen what what would you do about it is the, is the question well firstly you would try to remember what got you interested in this topic in the first place right and then the other thing to to notice is that your study is has some flexibility it's not set in absolute stone and for this I've actually drawn a, a diagram it's a triangle it has three corners, so to speak, or vertices. This is this is you, right, the PhD candidate, that's your supervisor, and that's the institution, the host institution where you're studying, or the funding agency that is funding your PhD studies, one or the other. In some cases, that, that might not be a very, very big factor, but in most cases it is. And this represents the space of interest. So you have interests, your supervisor has interests and expertise, and your funding body or host institution has interests as well. And it's a space, right? And you can move around in that space. There's room to move in there. It's not an infinite space, by the way. It's a bounded space. But there's room to move. So you might be working on something very specific and you lose interest, but it can change. There's some flexibility. You can talk to your supervisor and say, like, I would like to make this subject a little bit more interesting to me. How can we do that? Can we talk about that? 
and just do it just do it like find you might be surprised at your supervisor's very supportive re response if, if somebody if if somebody said this to me i would definitely want to have a conversation about it and try to figure out okay where in this space can we find a compromise between the students interests the supervisor's interest in the in the the institute's interest right it's not an infinite space because your supervisor has a, a limited knowledge you have limited knowledge and so does your institution right so you all you have to be or you want to be working on something novel that's part of the boundary space you don't want to be working on something that's not novel right you right you want to be working on something that contributes knowledge so that's one of the reasons that's a bounded space, and it's a space that has to be navigated with some guidance and some and some careful thought. Right? You can't just pick a random direction to go in because there's a danger that it's that it's not novel, right? And it also has to align with your supervisor's interests because you don't want to pick on even if you pick something novel, you want to pick something that your supervisor can help you with, right? You don't want to, it's as soon as you go outside your supervisor's area of expertise, you might, the, the, the question of whether something is novel or not is, is hard to answer and, and sometimes maybe impossible. You need to find an expert that really knows what's novel and what's not, what's solved and what's not solved in, in a particular research direction. And I save the most kind of abstract thing for last so to speak i'm sure there are some other points that i missed but these are the the, the five that i thought of for this question <laughs> this one's fun a general negative thought pattern or a general general negative thought patterns you might have general negative thought patterns that deteriorate your motivation during your PhD studies right I th now some of these comments are going to apply to more than just PhD candidates and this one is gonna actually be one of those so it's not only PhD candidates that might have general negative thought patterns so patterns of thought in your head that are very negative and are very cyclic so they're repeating over and over again and the, the they're not helpful and with a PhD candidate though there's definitely going to be focused on future or what what you more accurately call the perceived future it's not a future you can experience it's just an imaginary future a perceived future like I'm never gonna finish Right, or this is never going to work, <laughs> that sort of thing. Right, those are future oriented, perceived future oriented negative thought patterns. So, this is another big topic, really big. I'm this is good though, because I can offload this topic to experts that have already spoken massively about this and know a lot more about this than I do but I can get you started remember like a lot of people don't know this but thought is at least 90 percent automatic so most thought is automatic now what does that mean most thought is actually involuntary so at least 90% of all thought is involuntary. So you can demonstrate that or you can, you can sort of, as a, as a fun exercise, and maybe you've already tried this or maybe somebody has already tried this on you, so to speak. You can just tell yourself to stop thinking. Right? Or you can tell somebody else, just stop thinking. Right? And you quickly discover that it's very, very difficult. So 
thought is basically or most thought is automatic I would say it's at least 90 percent automatic and actually that's not a big surprise when you think of it as a bodily function so all of your bodily functions are automatic right your breathing is automatic your digestion is automatic you know your growth and contraction are automatic your nervous system is automatic you wouldn't want to have to control these things actively anyways if you had to control all these things then you wouldn't you would die right thought I, I like to think of thought is very analogous to breathing so you can breathe voluntarily right you can tell your stomach when to inhale or your, your lungs to when to exhale right and you can also hold your breath for some time so there's voluntary breath and there's automatic or involuntary breath and 90 more than 90 percent of your breath or breathing is automatic and involuntarily it's the it's thought you can have voluntary thoughts when somebody asks you okay I want you to think about a, a yellow balloon you can do that you can think about a yellow balloon for a few seconds and then the automatic thoughts take over right if you're a trained expert you can you can think about a yellow ball or a yellow balloon or whatever for a long time but it takes training right it's it's meditation so that's something a lot of people don't know is that thought is generally automatic and involuntary so that thought and that news if you have if that's news to you and you don't already know that that should really get you thinking <laughs> it's 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 kind of it's it's interesting it's interesting this has a name by the way the involuntary thought that takes place inside here in your mind has a name and it's also called the human condition right this involuntary negative thought patterns this general involuntary negative thought patterns is also called the human condition or it's the basis of the human condition so you can google human con condition and then guess what you're opening up a huge topic which I think is very helpful to explore and if you want to hear from the world's leading expert on this topic, I'm going to refer you to a book called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. I'll put a link to information. There's a free version of that audio book on YouTube. Last time I checked, it's it's a great, great book. And then you'll, you'll really know all about automatic involuntary thought and the nature of automatic involuntary thought involuntary thought by the way if you read this book or listen to what Eckhart Tolle has to say he has lots and lots of great videos on YouTube and he is the world's leading expert on understanding basically the, the human psyche and the last thing I will point out is another thing that I uh, actual motivational talk that I really would recommend everybody sees it's it's Randy Pausch and it's called his last lecture so Randy Pausch's last lecture absolutely now that's a proper motivational talk and it's it's really really outstanding so I would recommend everybody watch that like it doesn't matter if you're a PhD candidate like I said this is not just about PhD candidates this is about essentially the, the human race watch that video it's great I'm gonna I've already watched it once I'm gonna watch it again and I don't really need to put a link I can put a link below this video and I just checked it has 18 million views it looks like at least I think there are multiple versions on YouTube but one of them has 18 million million views I'm not going to talk about it I'm just going to say go watch it and you're going to feel a lot different well you're going to feel a lot different if you look at the power of now or read this power of now book and what's more sort of instant gratification let's say is watching Randy Pausch's last lecture really really amazing stuff
Okay, so thank you, Syed. Thanks for uh, asking that question, and I hope that you find it a useful answer. And let me know if you have any more questions.